I am a big fan of history. And I think that there's a lot to be learned in current day uh, in the past, in particular U.S. history, uh, as we look at the world that we are in today. And I always draw some uh, inspiration uh, and some fascination by what people have said in the past, in particular those that uh, were leading the country or were in charge and the speeches that they gave. So for me, I'm a, as much as I love history, I thought I would... Uh, do my part to pass some of this along and read some of these uh, historical speeches that were given uh, that I think uh, resonate today. And I think that they hold some value today. Uh, on June 16th, we're going to start with this one by Abraham Lincoln. On June 16th, 1858, believe it or not, more than 1,000 delegates in Springfield, Illinois State House for the Republican State Convention. At 5 p.m., they chose Abraham Lincoln as their candidate in the U.S. Senate, running against Democrat Stephen Douglas. At 8 o'clock, Lincoln delivered this address, this following address, to his Republican colleagues in the Hall of Representatives. The title reflects part of the speech's introduction. A house divided against itself cannot stand. It's a concept familiar to Lincoln's audience as a statement by Jesus recorded in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Even Lincoln's friends regarded the speech as too radical for the occasion. His law partner, William Herndon, considered Lincoln as morally courageous but politically incorrect. Lincoln read the speech to him before delivering it, referring to the house-divided language this way. The proposition is indisputably true, and I will deliver it as written. I want to use some universally known figure, expressed in simple language as universally known, that it may strike home to the minds of men in order to rouse them to the peril of the times. The speech created many repercussions, giving Lincoln's political opponents fresh ammunition. Herndon remarked, when I saw Senator Douglas making such headway against Mr. Lincoln's house-divided speech, I was nettled and irritable and said to Mr. Lincoln, One day this, Mr. Lincoln, why in the world do you not say to Mr. Douglas, when he is making capital out of your speech, Douglas, why whine and complain to me because of that speech? I am not the author of it. I go and whine and complain to him for its revelations Mr. Lincoln looked at me one short quizzical moment and replied, I cannot. Reflecting on it several years later, Herndon said the speech did awaken the people, and despite Lincoln's defeat, he thought the speech made him president. Through logic inductively seen, he said, Lincoln as a statesman and political philosopher announced an eternal truth, not only as broad as America, but covers the world. Another colleague, Leonard Sweat, said the speech defeated Lincoln in the Senate campaign. In 1866, he wrote to Herndon complaining, nothing could have been more unfortunate or inappropriate. It was saying first the wrong thing, yet he saw it as an abstract truth. But standing by the speech would ultimately find him in the right place. Here is the speech. Mr. President and gentlemen of the convention, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure, permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Have we no tendency to the latter condition? 
Let anyone who doubts carefully contemplate that now, almost complete legal combination, a piece of machinery, so to speak, compounded of the Nebraska doctrine and the terrible Dred Scott decision. Let him consider not only what work the machinery is adapted to do and how well adapted, but also let him study the history of its construction, the trace, if he can, or rather fail, if he can, to trace the evidence of design and concert of action among its chief architects from the very beginning. But so far, Congress only had acted and an endorsement by the people, real or apparent, was indispensable to save the point already gained and give chance to more. The new year of 1854 found slavery excluded from more than half the states by state constitutions and from most of the national territory by congressional prohibition. Four days later, commenced the struggle which ended in repealing that congressional prohibition. This opened up all the national territory to slavery and was the first point gained. This necessity has not been overlooked, but had been provided for, as well might be, in the notable argument of squatter sovereignty, otherwise called sacred right of self-government, which latter phrase, through expressive of the only rightful basis of any government, was so perverted in this attempted use of it as an amount to just this, that if any one man chooses to enslave another, No third man shall be allowed to object. That argument was incorporated into the Nebraska bill itself in the language which follows. It being the true intent and meaning of this act not to legislate slavery into any territory or state, not to exclude it therefrom, but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. Then open the roar of loose declamation in favor of squatter sovereignty and sacred right of self-government. But, said opposition leaders, let us be more specific. Let us amend the bill so as to expressly declare that the people of the territory may exclude slavery. Not we, said the friends of the measure, and down they voted the amendment. While the Nebraska bill was passed through Congress, a law case involving the question of a Negro's freedom by reason of his owner having voluntarily taken him first into a free state and then a territory covered by the congressional prohibition and held him as a slave for a long time in each was passing through the U.S. District Court of the District of Missouri and both Nebraska bill and lawsuit were brought to a decision in the same month of May 1854. The Negro's name was Dred Scott, which name now designates the decision finally made in the case. But the then next presidential election, the law case came to and was argued in the Supreme Court of the United States. But the decision of it was deferred until after the election. Still, before the election, Senator Trumbull, on the floor of the Senate, requests the leading advocate of the Nebraska bill to state his opinion whether the people of the territory can constitutionally exclude slavery from their limits, and the latter, This is a question for the Supreme Court. The election came, Mr. Buchanan was elected, and the endorsement, such as it was, secured. That was the second point gained. The endorsement, however, fell short of a clear popular majority by nearly 400,000 votes, and so, perhaps, was not overwhelmingly reliable and satisfactory. You see, the outgoing president, in his last annual message, as impressively as possible, echoed back upon the people the weight and authority of that endorsement. The Supreme Court met again, did not announce their decision, but ordered a re-argument. The presidential inauguration came and still no decision of the court, but the incoming president, in his inaugural address, fervently exhorted the people to abide by the forthcoming decision, whatever might be. Then in a few days came the decision. The reputed author of the Nebraska Phil finds an early occasion to make a speech at this Capitol endorsing the Dred Scott decision and vehemently denouncing all opposition to it. The new president, too, seizes the early occasion of the Silman letter to endorse. 
strongly construe that decision and to express his astonishment that any different view had ever been entertained. At length, a squabble springs up between the president and the author of the Nebraska bill on the mere question of fact, whether the Lecompton Constitution was or was not in any or just sense made by the people of Kansas. And in that squabble, the latter declares that all he wants is a fair vote for the people and that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or up. I do not understand his declaration that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or voted up to be intended by him other than as an apt definition of the policy he would impress upon the public mind, the principle for which he declares he has suffered much and is ready to suffer to the end. And well may be cling to that principle if he has any parental feeling, well may be he cling to it. That principle is the only shred left in his original Nebraska doctrine. Under the Dred Scott decision, squatter sovereignty squatted out of existence, tumbled down like temporary scaffolding, like the mold that the foundry served through one blast and fell back into loose sand, helped to carry an election, and then was kicked to the winds. His late joint struggle with the Republicans against the Lecompton Constitution involves nothing of the original Nebraska doctrine. That struggle was made on point, and the right of the people to make up their own constitution, upon which he and the Republicans have never deferred. The several points of the Dred Scott decision, in connection with Senator Douglas's care-not policy, constitute the piece of machinery in its present state of advancement. This was the third point gained. The working points of that machinery are, first, That no Negro slave imported as such from Africa and no descendant of such slave can ever be a citizen of any state in the sense that the term used in the Constitution of the United States. This point is made in order to deprive the Negro in every possible event of the benefit of this provision of the United States Constitution, which declares that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Secondly, that subject to the Constitution of the United States, neither Congress nor a territorial legislature can exclude slavery from any United States territory. This point is made in order that individual men may fill up the territories with slaves without danger of losing them as property and thus to enhance the chances of permanency to the institution through all the future. Thirdly, that whether the holding of a Negro in actual slavery in a free state makes him free, as against the holder, the United States courts will not decide, but will leave to be decided by the courts of any slave state the Negro may be forced into by the master. This point is made not to be pressed immediately, but, If acquiesced in for a while and apparently endorsed by the people at an election, then to sustain the logical conclusion that what Dred Scott's master might lawfully do with Dred Scott in the free state of Illinois, every other master may lawfully do with any other one or 1,000 slaves in, in, in Illinois or in any other free state. Auxiliary to all this and working hand in hand with it, the Nebraska doctrine, or what is left of it, is to educate and mold public opinion, at least northern public opinion. To not care whether slavery is voted down or up, this shows exactly where we now are, and partially also whither we are tending. It will throw additional light on the latter to go back and run the mind over the string of historical facts already stated. Several things will now appear less dark and mysterious than they did when they were transpiring, The people were to be left perfectly free, subject only to the Constitution. What the Constitution had to do with it, outsiders could not then see. Plainly enough enough now, it was an exactly fitted niche for the Dred Scott decision to afterward come in and declare the perfect freedom of the people to be just no freedom at all. Why was the amendment expressly declaring the right of the people to exclude slavery voted down? Plainly enough, now the adoption of it would have spoiled the niche for the Dred Scott decision. Why was the court decision held up? Why even a senator's individual opinion withheld till after the presidential election? Plainly enough, now the speaking out then would have damaged the perfectly free argument upon which the election was to be carried. 
Why the outgoing president's felicitation on the endorsement? Why the DLA of the re-argument? Why the incoming president's advance exhortation in favor of the decision? These things look like the cautious padding and petting of a spirited horse, preparatory to mounting him, when it is dreaded that he may give the rider a fall. And why the hasty after-endorsements of the decision by the president and others? We cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert. But when we see a lot of framed timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out of different times and places and by different workmen, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, for instance, and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting, and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places, and not a piece too many or too few, not emitting even scaffolding, or if a single piece be lacking, we can see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared to yet bring such a piece in. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Rogers and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the lick was struck. It should not be overlooked that by the Nebraska bill, the people of the state, as well as territory, were to be left perfectly free, subject only to the Constitution. Why mention a state? These were legislating for territories and not for or about states. Certainly the people of a state are and ought to be subject to the Constitution of the United States. But why is mention of this lugged into the merely territorial law? Why are the people of a territory and the people of a state therein lumped together and their relation to the Constitution therein treated as being precisely the same? While the opinion of the court by Chief Justice Taney in the Dred Scott decision and the separate opinions of all the concurring judges expressly declare that the Constitution of the United States neither permits Congress nor a territorial legislator to exclude slavery from any United States territory, they all omit to declare whether or not the same Constitution prevents a state or the people of a state to exclude it. Possibly, this is a mere omission, but can we be quite sure? If McLean or Curtis had sought to get into the opinion a declaration of unlimited power in the people of a state to exclude slavery from their limits, just as Chase and Macy sought to get such declaration in behalf of the people of a territory into the Nebraska bill, I ask, who can be quite sure that it would not have been voted down in the one case as it would have been in the other. The nearest approach to the point of declaring the power of state over slavery is made by Judge Nelson. He approached it more than once using the precise idea and almost the language, too, of the Nebraska Act. On one occasion, his exact language is, except in cases where the power is restrained by the Constitution of the United States, the law of the state is supreme over the subject of slavery within its jurisdiction. In what cases the power of the states is so restrained by the U.S. Constitution is left to an open question. Precisely as the same question as to the restraint on the power of the territories was left open in the Nebraska Act. Put that and that together, and we have a nice little niche, which we may long see filled with another Supreme Court decision declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude slavery from its limits. And this may especially be expected if the doctrine of care not whether slavery be voted down or voted up shall gain upon the public mind sufficiently to give promise that such a decision and be maintained when made. Such a decision is all that slavery now lacks of being alike lawful in all the states. Welcome or unwelcome, such a decision is probably coming and will soon be upon us, unless the power of the present political dynasty shall be met and overthrown. We shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free. We shall awake to the reality, instead, that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. To meet and overthrow the power of that dynasty is to work now before all those who would prevent that consummation. This is what we have to do.
But how can we best do it? There are those who denounce us openly to their own friends and yet whisper us softly that Senator Douglas is the aptest instrument there is with which to affect that object. They wish us to infer all from the facts that he now has little quarrel with the present head of the dynasty and that he has regularly voted with us on a single point upon which he and we have never deferred. That remind us that he is a great man and that the largest of us are very small ones. Let this be granted. But a living dog is better than a dead lion. Judge Douglas, if not a dead lion for this work, is at least a caged and toothless one. How can he oppose the advances of slavery? He don't care anything about it. His avowed mission is impressing the public heart to care nothing about it. A leading De Douglas Democrat newspaper thinks Douglas's superior talent will be needed to resist the revival of the African slave trade. Does Douglas believe in an effort to revive that trade is approaching? He has not said so. Does he really think so? But if it is, how can he resist it? For years, he has labored to prove it is a sacred right of the white man to take Negro slaves into the new territories. Can he possibly show that it is any less a sacred right to buy them where they can be bought cheapest? And unquestionably, they can be bought cheaper in Africa than in Virginia. He has done all in his power to reduce the whole question of slavery to one of mere right of property. And as such, how can he oppose the foreign slave trade? How can he refuse that trade in that property? Shall be perfectly free unless he does it as a protection to the home production. And as the home producers will probably not ask the protection, he will be wholly without a ground of opposition. Senator Douglas holds, we know, that a man may rightfully be wiser today than he was yesterday, that he may rightfully change when he finds himself wrong. But can we, for that reason, run ahead and infer that he will make any particular change of which he himself has given no intimation? Can we safely base our action upon such a vague inference? Now, as ever, I wish not to misrepresent Judge Douglas's position, question his motives, or do aught that he can personally find offense. When ever, if ever, he and we can come together on principle so that our greatest cause may have assistance from his great ability, I hope to have interposed no adventitious obstacle. Clearly, he is now with us. He does not pretend to be. He does not promise to ever be. Our cause, then, must be entrusted to and conducted by its own undoubted friends, those whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, and who do care for the result. Two years ago, the Republicans of the nation mustered over 1,300,000 strong. We did this under the single impulse of a resistance to a common danger with every external circumstance against us. Our strange, discordant, and even hostile elements. We gathered from our four winds and formed and fought the battle through under the constant hot fire of a disciplined, proud, and pampered enemy. Did we brave all then to falter now? Now? When that same enemy is wavering, is disserviced and belligerent, the result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate our mistakes or delay them, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. Abraham Lincoln <laughs>